expected as we go along. It always does. <laughs> Hello, people, we're here. We were just talking about it before and I was forgetting to put the recorder on and now I've put the recorder on. So, please, the gods, we're working. And I was just about to say, I'm thrilled. Yes. And I, I, I have given myself several gold stars and, um, and I gave myself uh, some honey yesterday as an extra treat wow. uh, because I'm doing the compost bins. Always a good idea. Spring cleaning and compost really work together. And so there's all the compost bins that were now half full because, as you probably know, you know, compost sort of does this as it works. And I'm just I've got a new salad bed to make or I had it's in process now and it needed earth. So I've been tipping you know, pulling the I've got these Dalek ones so it's really easy. You just pull the top off and there you are. And even cripples like me can handle it. So I pulled it off and I've got eight bins and I've done all but uh, two now. And say so the, the earth in the bed originally was about yay from the top and mm. it was about eight feet by eight feet. Yeah. And now it's up to the top. Excellent. And I've still got two bins to go. Excellent. You have to build some more beds. And um, no, I should just move it to a different place. <laughs> I don't need any more beds. <laughs> but and I'm getting together one bin of the sort of half done stuff and layering it in with um, mouse dorfer. That's the biodynamic prep. And also um, Kim down the road has got goats as well as horses. So she just brought me a, a, a sack of goat shit. Excellent. So I was layering goat shit in there and then some more compost and then some mouse dorper and then some more goat shit and that sort of thing. So I shall have to phone her and say when she comes up on Thursday, I need more goat shit or horse shit. I don't mind, whatever. Apparently I can have horse shit too. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. And like you, she doesn't give them anything dreadful. Hmm. Um, and so the horse shit will be fine. Yeah, excellent. So I'm all sort of thrilled because I made, you know, a hell of a lot actually of compost last yeah. year. And it's all just looks... what you're doing, of course, you know, in, in the modern buzzwords, is you're, you're fixing carbon. You're locking carbon into the soil. Well, and we need to do that. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't thought about being a modern buzzword, but you're right. Mm. <laughs> and it, it really is. Um, I don't know how many of you make compost, but I was, I, I've been doing it all my life, and my dad was doing it, so I was watching as a kid. And I'm always amazed. You get to the good bit, you know, not the bits that you put on. Yeah, you should have really stopped. And it looks just like earth. I mean, it is earth. Mm. And I mean, they call it humus and all this sort of thing. But I mean, the difference, it must be sort of, I think only pedantic people fuss like that, don't they? Well, good soil should contain lots and lots of the fibrous organic matter anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that's what soil is. I mean, if you leave, I mean, that's what, you know, when the leaves drop and the plants yeah. die down, I mean, that's what nature's been doing a hell of a lot longer than we've been compost. All, all the bacteria and the fungal mycorrhiza and the worms, everyone who does it, for, when we say we do it, we actually don't do very much at all. We, we heap no. it all in one place and leave it. Mm, yeah. Um, and in fact, what I've been doing when I'm mucking out the barn here is I just take barrow loads and I just dump them under the trees in the orchard. Yeah. yeah. With the result that the soil in the orchard is now nearly a foot thicker than it was when I came two years ago. Yeah. I'm yeah. still growing. Yeah. And later this year, I shall, I, shall, I shall move the chickens onto that when they're allowed out of their avian flu lockdown. And they'll scrabble and scratch and dig it around and pull out anything interesting by way of seeds and worms and things. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and quite possibly next year, I'll put a couple of pigs on it. That would really do some good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, I'll reseed it and it'll be a beautiful meadow under the orchard. Yeah. Yeah. And I will have fixed probably a couple of tons of carbon into it. I should be interested to know how much I actually fix with my eight, um, what are they, 90, 70 litre compost bins? Mm. They're the biggest ones, and I think it's 70 litres. So there's eight of them. Yes. Um, that go every year. Yes. Um, because I've got a reasonable amount of garden. So by the time it gets all the weeds in there and all the kitchen and that. 
So I'd be interested. But talking of soil, yes. Yesterday morning, there I was heaving shit, <laughs> well, heaving compost because it was no yes. longer shit. And um, there's this car in in the farmer's yard. Nobody else was about. It wasn't a car that I recognised. So, hmm. You know how you do in the country. What's going on over there then? Mm-hmm. And um, nobody turned up. Anyway, after about half an hour, this bloke came up through the field. It's quite dishy too, so I got a bit of a treat. And um, nothing like a bit of eye candy when you're working hard. Absolutely, it's absolutely on. Anyway, there he was, and he was very nice. Hello, he goes in. Hello, I thought he was a walker because we've got a footpath going through there. And he climbs over the stile and he's got two white plastic buckets in his arms. So I thought, interesting. You know, I never carry my lunch that way where I'm walking, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Don't argue. So he climbs over and he said, Oh, I'm Luke. I'm, <clears throat> I've been down the field. And uh, I said, Right, is it good down there? He said, Yeah. He said, I've been taking soil samples. So he just went boing. <laughs> And um, so I said, oh, he said, no, he said, the farmer, uh, well, he said, the, the main farmer, who is now the son, uh, Tim, um, he's asked me to come and um, take soil samples and see how much carbon they're fixing. Excellent. Uh, I really go for John and Tim. They are organic. And there are a few things I wish they'd do slightly differently, but basically they're very, very good. They use mycorrhiza all the time and they use the, the mycorrhizal spray whose long names I can never remember. And they've just been doing that. And um, where I am is all pasture. They do occasional sort of a, like a clover lay. We've got a clover, a clover lay is a clover field. Yeah. Um, just opposite us, which is going to be stunning in June. You just go out and breathe. Is it red clover or white clover? Uh, red, I think. Oh, it, red, was, red, it was red last time. Right. So I think it's red. And um, when they harvest it, you just go and sleep outside and don't bother to sleep. You just go and breathe. Yes. Because you know how mown grass smells, people. It, it's pretty good. And mown hay, when it's organic hay, smells pretty good. Mown clover hay just knocks you out your head. It does. Totally. You do have to be careful feeding it to your livestock, though. It's very rich stuff. Yeah, yeah. They too, too they make, they 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 take it, of course, mm. um, as as one crop, um, but then they mix it when they're they're doing, and they use it um, for the beef cattle when they trying well, to finish, when they're finishing them, as yeah. they call it. Although they don't get finished indoors. Yeah, and um, they also I think they use it because up here is beef, and down in the valley across the road is the milk and he does organic milk so they you know they they keep they bring the male calves on really well and then you know sell them and and they're all super organic beef and that and the females all um breed for milk yeah yeah um so it's it really works across and so i think what sort of cows he's using uh mostly aberdeen angus but he's got I think he's got some short horn in there. It would be an unusual dairy farmer who ran Aberdeen Angus. They're not noted for milk. No, um, that's what he's got up here. Short, short horn, sorry. Brilliant. Short horns. Short and I, they do seem to mix them because we get, I mean, I see them mostly up here. So I see the beef cattle. Um, and some of those are black and, and mm. Angus, um, but they will go, uh, the females, and but they will go for beef. Um, but there's some brown and white ones in there as well. Well, they might be short one or they might be Ayrshire. I think they're short one. I'm pretty sure I haven't heard him mention Ayrshire. Ayrshire don't tend to milk as well as short ones. No, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. And, you know, he wants them for because he sells the organic milk, obviously. Yes. And yes. Um, he wants them for the milking. Excellent. So I'm really, really pleased with him. And he's really, really pleased with me because the last year, when I, this time of year, when I was digging over the first veg bed, and um, John saw me sprinkling these sort of whitish gray pellets over this and then digging them in. What are you doing there then? I said, Mycorrhiza. He went, 
<laughs> of course, if he's an organic farmer, he should know about mycorrhiza. He does, but he's not yeah. used to gardeners doing it. Excellent. And so, I mean, that was half an hour we were chatting mm. about what we do and how we do it and all this sort of thing. And there's a possible um, thing. I saw Tim yesterday and they might give me a pint of the liquid spray. Oh, excellent. That they use is if we've got any spare and if dad don't want it first. I said, no, that's fine. <laughs> you should that know we've got like place it. on the priority list. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Family comes first. You know, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, it certainly makes a difference. I mean, the fields are good mm. and uh, there's a lot of nice grasses and it's fairly mixed. It's not as mixed as I would like. And um, he takes silage too often. He takes three. Yeah. He'll try and take three cuts a year. And um, he was saying to me all oh, over a year ago now, he says, well, I don't get so many skylarks as I used to. Because you've thought, just milled their nests up, mate. I thought, I'm not going to say it. I don't know you well enough yet. <laughs> so just because someone is organic, they can still be screwing up a bit. So, yeah. you know, you yeah. need to think about everything, people. You know, don't just take a label. It's not Armani and go and wear it kind of thing. Mm. It's different to that. No, you've always got to adapt to where you are and what the land is and what it wants. Absolutely. Yeah. We certainly have to do that up here where you have to, where you are. Yes. It's certainly different land we have between us. Yes. What's your land mostly? It's an alluvial clay underneath what appears to be a layer of stones. Oh, it's not <laughs> that different from mine then. No, no, it, it's, it's on old red sandstone as a bedrock. I don't think we are. So it's a reddish, a reddish clay. No, this is, this is um, pale. There is some red, mm. there, but it's pale. And you go, I mean, I always used to garden with a fork. I got Spade. a mattock. A mattock, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to use the sort of spade shaped end, but mm. I also, I've had to use the pick end, pick side as well. Um, you need more soil. Yes. Why do you think I'm making compost? <laughs> Well, you'd make compost anyway, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, I'm fortunate in that down, down the road in Herefordshire, not very far in, there's a farm which I found them, oh, 20 years ago when we first went to Hereford. And they do muck, mm. i.e. cow shit. They do, they're, an, they're organic farmers. And they do use their own muck on their land, but that Herefordshire land is much, much better than mine. I mean, you go down miles yes. um, with that. And, but they also bag it and sell it. They dry it and bag it and sell it. Right. And I go down there and the, the, the blokes who fill the car up just laugh because I've got this little clear. Mm. So um, everything goes down flat. And last time I went down there, and these are 70 litre bags, and I got 15 in with one on the passenger seat strapped yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> and they were sort of like, your car gonna take it? Yeah, I've done it before. <laughs> so I have to, because the, the, there isn't any. Yes, eventually uh, there will be. There will be, yeah. yeah. And I can't ask the farmers for muck because they've got the same problem and they want it yeah. all for their own land. Yes. So I might get a bucket from John to go on my trees this year, but that would be all. Mm. And, um, you know, and I could do with about 10 of his big tractor buckets. Yes. Um, but I ain't yes. going to get that. And well, that's, that's what I'm doing here. I'm very lucky here. I've got four horses. That's eight tons of muck a year. Perfect. And it all goes back on the land. Well, how's about you sort of bring a large trailer down with you when you come in there? <laughs> I've only got a small trailer. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a couple of extra days holiday shoveling muck. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll just save up the old feed sacks, stuff them full, shove them in a trailer and just leave the sacks with you to deal with your leisure. You can do that. Yeah. I'm very happy with that, that, that and I'd love your horses muck anyway, because I, A, I love your horses, and B, it'll be good muck. <laughs> yes. 
No, I, anybody who's going to give me muck, which is, you know, Kim's so good down there. She said, oh, we've got some, you can have some muck. Said, yes. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's great. It's funny too. Um, and when I was doing goat shit yesterday, and she just bought me a sack of it. So it was like, you know, sprinkle some out. And um, so, of course, it doesn't go where you want it to go. And you want it to spread. It was in there. Lumps, yes. In the hands. Yes. It, it's a little bit smelly, so you come in and wash your hands. That's what soap is for, yes. Yeah, you know, you don't stick them in your eye and your mouth when you've just <coughs> had them in the goat shit. Go in and wash your hands first. Oh. And um, it, honestly, you'll live. <laughs> oh, God, yes. Of course you will. And it, it's, you know, it's no major problem if you have a few spare bacteria left on your fingers. We're covered in bacteria all the time. Mm. And yeah. where, where was it? Oh, yeah. Um, hopefully some of you have seen that. Totally, I actually watched television for a change. Wow. Yeah. Well, they Paul got this programme on and there were these two sort of bouncy people, you know, a man and a woman. And you always sort of worry when you get these sort of, oh, cheerful people. And you, this is going to be awful. It wasn't. They were both scientists which does help because scientists actually are often bouncy and they were investigating sewage and it's up on um wise woman well website uh wise woman page facebook page <laughs> and they're investigating sewage <clears throat> and they went to the big sewage works outside birmingham and um it is quite fascinating. I mean, I, I know what sewage works do roughly. I've never actually had the urge to visit. Um, but they were talking about all the things that sewage does. This is mostly, well, they, oh yeah, the other lovely thing is they called it shit and turds. Yes. And I was like, yes, we're not having poo. <laughs> People are so mealy-mouthed sometimes, yes. Yeah. There's not, you know, shit is actually quite an old word. I'll leave it to you. Well, it is, it's a very old word. And um, turds, similarly. Yeah. And rather than sort of going a fecal matter or something, <laughs> which is like fecal matter, four syllables, they meant turds, which is one syllable. Yeah. And um, everybody knew what they meant, of course. So they were discussing, you know, what was in those and what was in the pee and all this sort of thing. And they were going right through from um, compost that you can actually use after about two, after about two, well, two years is what people have found. You can mm. actually use it to grow your own food in your own garden. It will have gone through. If you work on it biodynamically, it'll go faster. Yeah. Um, but they're not going to do that in Birmingham Sewage Works. And um, mm -hmm. they went into medicines. And the bacteria that are in um, shit and pee, you can, they're so useful to actually help with other conditions, which many people nowadays suffer because we've actually got too clean, really. Mm -hmm. Dettol adverts, you know, they really hurt things. You, you need more bacteria, you need to be part of your environment. So they were really going into that. And the one that I like best, and that you, you'll be able to explain this to us, I hope, is um, the guy said, hang on a minute, I'm just, I just need a pee, I'm going to charge my phone. Aha! Aha! I knew you'd get it! <laughs> I, I have come across references to this, but I don't actually know exactly what's involved. Well, he, I do know you can you can use pee to charge a phone because, like anything, pee has pee is not just plain water. No, 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 no. Mm. And in fact, even with water, you can you can get electricity out of water, mm. as everyone knows who lives near a hydroelectric dam. Absolutely. But <laughs> you, you can generate electricity from the electrolytes in your pee, and that's what they were doing. Yes. And they got little sort of fuel cell things. Um, I don't know what they're made of. Um, I can't get enough out of Paul because he keeps getting his head into something else because he sort of knows, knows this. And Fiona's just going to look it up. And um, you, you, you sort of, 
he was collecting his pee because this was still an experimental station. And then you pour it on these fuel cells and brrr, his phone went. Right, it's a microbial fuel cell that contains waste eating electroactive bacteria. Yes. So you put the pee in one end and the bacteria use your pee to generate electricity. And what comes out the other end? Probably pure water and a bit of carbon dioxide. Or very nearly pure water, I would have thought anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So people pause while Fiona's reading stuff. Yeah, right. Um, it, and it's and the other thing, of course, that um, sewage makes is methane. Yes. And methane you can use to power your car. And way, way, way back, this must have been around possibly even the late 70s, certainly in the 80s, Pimlico ran on methane from sewage. Mm in London. I don't think they do anymore. There's a there's a big uh, biogas production facility between me and Peter Head here. Mm. They feed directly into the, the mains grid. Yeah. And they have gigantic green domes that are held up by the, all the methane inside. Yeah. But they are constantly getting trailer loads and trailer loads of, of compost. Mm. Yeah, uh, and then they, they compost it and gather all the methane up under these domes and pipe it straight into the mains gas mm -hmm. transmission network. I know with the Pimlico one, they actually used the whichever bit of the sewage system it was that ran Pimlico. And it actually came directly. And I mean, what a thing. You know, you've got a sodding grape. I mean, the size of this Birmingham sewage works was sort of like acres and acres of it. And it would have been so easy for somebody to put the relevant equipment on it so that you just let it bubble. Yes. And do it. And it's going to anyway, so why not capture the gas as it makes off into the air? Exactly. And it then A, you don't have so much in the atmosphere, which is a good thing. Hmm. And B, you are making electricity, you're making power for your car. You can um, use it for cooking gas. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And they bring out all of these sort of things, and um, as well as the, like the compost and all this sort of thing. And I, I, for goodness sake, what has happened to the television? We've actually got something interesting and useful. When I get round to replacing my cesspit here, which I will have to do at some point, I would really like to put in a biogas generator instead. Yeah. Because you can get them. Yeah, you can. And yeah. You, you put it in, it runs on, it takes a small amount of energy just to, to keep it warm enough for the bacteria to work. Mm. But then everything that goes in generates methane that comes back to heat your house. Indeed. And I mean, you can sort of then gradually that can work around so that it's actually heating itself to make itself. Yes. It's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and I, do get, I do get very cold winters here, so it probably would need a bit of heat in the winter. Mm. Well, you've got, a very, like you've got a very good stove as well. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so that's it. And as they, the scientists kept on saying, which I was so pleased with them for doing, he said, this is totally sustainable. Yes. And they, they said exactly how, well, not exactly, but, you know, the average of how much pee and shit we each do each day. Mm. And um, this is, this would be enormous. And we're wasting it. Yes. We just waste it. Well, not even that. It's worse than that. We're yeah. not just wasting it. We're using it to pollute the atmosphere. Mm. We're pumping yeah. nitrates down the rivers that cause fish that cause algal blooms that then suffocate the fish. Yeah. You know, we're, we're pumping methane into the atmosphere, which is greenhouse gas. Whereas if you if you combust methane, you get carbon dioxide and water. You can fix your carbon dioxide, and the water is is just water. You put it back in the water cycle. Yeah, which you do. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, yeah. And it's not actually too terribly hard if you do your agriculture and your gardening and your living properly um, to fix carbon dioxide. And please don't rush out and plant billions of the wrong trees in the wrong place. No, but do build a compost heap because that yeah, will fix carbon. Yeah. 
and do have some trees in your garden. Yes, plant fruit trees. Absolutely. And, you, you know, go and have a look around and see what likes to grow in your garden, your soil. And grow them. I mean, yes. even, even lettuces help. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> and you can like, I eat those. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so do I. So, um, it, it was a very, very, very interesting program. Mm. I was actually sort of like, wow, I'm actually watching TV. Like live TV, TV that is on now, not something that I recorded that I felt I might want to watch. Yes. I never do this. I think this is probably a first for years. <laughs> so, yeah, mm. bring cleaning, compost. Yes. It all has to cycle. I, I think it's something we've got to get away from is the idea that you have a start and an end. Mm -hmm. you, you have a start and an end. Mm -hmm. And it keeps going and it's got to keep going. Yeah. So we need to break out of a linear mode of thought. We do get a bit stuck with that, though, with the Big Bang Theory. I've always wanted to know what happened before that. Oh, so do the scientists, but you never hear about that on TV. Well, that's because they can't figure it out. Exactly. Therefore, it's a bit like um, when they were looking for the Higgs boson particle. Mm. And you would hear on all the TV channels, including the BBC, they've lost the Higgs boson. I dropped it under the table. It's gone under the carpet. I don't know where it's gone. Yes. It's like, <laughs> it's out there somewhere. It'll be back in its own time. Don't worry. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> it was just like, I can't, I don't believe this. And it's sort of like, oh, we can't tell people that because they won't understand it. Well, you can try. Yeah. You don't have to talk about it in equations and 25 syllable words. No. Oh, it's got this mental image of the Higgs boson particle, part, the particle rather like a cat going, I'll be back later. <laughs> I, know, I, was, I did at the time. It was like, yeah. what? what what's, what's the quantum equivalent of tapping a cat food tin with a fork? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, the other one was um, this sort of bloody blame culture we're in. Is it? They haven't found it yet. Well, don't worry. That's Naughty still... people. You should have done it by now. Pardon? <laughs> Yeah. It, it's always a, it's always the question that occurs to me whenever they announce some great discovery in science. It's like, right, that's great. Now they've done that. What next? Oh, they do that. Yeah. Well, you yes. do that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Where do we go from here? We've taken a step. What's next? Hmm. And frankly, uh, I I've certainly had the chance of working with really top flying science scientists who actually don't need 25 syllable words or equations to explain what they mean um and then they're never finished no of course not and they, they would be horrified to finish on oh, might as well die then there's nothing to do absolutely you know but every time you discover anything in in science it opens the door to a new thresh a, a new vista beyond yeah. And you can spread out into a whole new field. Yeah. And that's the great thing about science. Yeah. It's also the great thing about shamanism, which does the same things. You and cross a threshold and there's a new playing field. This Go is back. it. And I find they're so alike. Yes. You know, people usually say, oh, I don't like science, I'm a shaman. And you go, why aren't you a real one then and get involved in the whole world? Yes. Because so much of it is so like i can't remember who it was who used to say that maths was the language of god uh, in, the, in the sense that yeah in the sense that mathematics helped explain how the world worked yeah how the universe worked yeah which it does yeah uh, you, you have to understand it a bit which i don't I'm, um, I'm not a mathematician at all my daughter is you're a bit better at math <laughs> mathematician than i am I can I can add up my bill in super in the supermarket. As far as I get these days. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but any further, and you go algebraic. I can't spell that. <laughs> 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 and was it equilaterally equilaterally 
triangles and equal and what's on the quality equations, you know, the same on each side. And I go, um, yeah, I yeah. need a cup of tea. <laughs> it's quite simple that one. You just go back to the Greek. Equi, same lateral sides. Yeah, but same I don't equity. I don't know what they are or how it all sort well, of it's it's triangle all, all three sides the same. Oh that does, yeah. Yeah. No, I was thinking, well, the squares on them are the same. Yeah. Uh, no, they're not. Um, yes, they are. No, that's right angle triangles. Yeah. Yeah, I was going on to right angle triangles. Yes. No, that's, that, that's I, I can cope with that much. I can cope with the right angle triangles ever since, I cannot remember his name. He was a scientist who did fabulous programs back in the 60s and 70s. And he actually did the square on the hypotenuse job with tessellations and he just opened them out and then folded them in mm. and I went yeah I've got it I see because you know you, normally when I was at school you used to get sort of about yay much writing in 0.6 mm. and that was supposed to explain it and I, it I, like, never, got, I never got to the point where I could actually write out the proof of the theorem I, I couldn't even know. read the. I couldn't even read the lesson. Yeah, <laughs> I know Michelle has actually worked through the proof and, and says it works. Mm. Says, That's good enough for me. Yeah. No, it was um, when he when this guy sort of just did these tessellations, mm. flip flip, and um, and they were quite big, sort of like lino tiles that he yeah. just flipped them with, and it's got it, totally got it. Um, so that's sort of interesting. But no, science is, it is the same. And you go and look at quantum and Schrodinger's cat stuff. And, you know, something is just potential, which is basically what it says. Yes. You are always just a potential. Now go and read your shaman books. Yes. You find they say the same thing, different words. Same thing. Yeah. Which is, of course, why we have this fascination with liminals. Because when you're between, you're neither one nor the other. Exactly. It gives you so much more potential. Yeah, which is a threshold. Yes. And you're standing there and you're not in the room and you're not out of the room. It's getting mythic now. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. How many of our old tales have the hero who could only be killed with one foot on the edge of a bath and the other on the back of a goat? And not wearing a lot. <laughs> but he can't be, he can be neither naked nor dressed. Yes. And uh, how do you want to have So, inside a house, not outside. So, you build a shed, a lean to, and you're half out of it and half out in it. Yes. You know? And um, yeah, we, we both love that story. Oh, yes. And uh, you imagine when he's actually got it and he's standing there showing Vadaya, you know, look, no hands. And yes. He goes, Whack, boom. Oh. <laughs> If anyone ever sets that up, you should you should be able to see it coming a mile off. You really should. But he doesn't, of course. But I mean, that's the whole point, isn't it? Because yeah. he's he's you know about as bright as a tock H lamp, as we used to say back in the day. A yeah. tock H lamp might have been a sight much of a candle power. Probably, probably not. Anyway, you know, a, a torch with a battery that is sort of. Mm, yeah, and um, he, he was about as bright as that, really. Mm -hmm. He got a lot brighter quite quickly. Incentive. Yeah, like getting, yes. getting a spear in your chest and having to fly off as an eagle and so get sorted out and get eaten by your aunt, um, who was big, um, was... Uh, there are learning curves and then there are learning curves, yes. Yes, that was sort of... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, it... Liminal threshold, yes, neither here nor there, in between, walking between worlds, yes, so, exactly. So, you know, and actually, science is a lot about that, yes, oh, it is, which is back to the big bang thing. And they really do want to know what, how did the big, big bang happen? Oh, yeah, of course, they do, and, and what was there before it. And that question that no one has ever answered for me, which is what's outside the universe? 
yeah, if you're going to have a, something that is finite, then there's got to be an inside and outside. Except, of course, what am I going to say? You're going to talk about that dreadful climb bottom again, aren't you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Shall I find that? Like, if I can find it. I'll yeah. see if I can find it. You talk about climb bottle while I go and look. Oh, the climb, bot the climb bottle is a dreadful thing. It's, it's a And you promise to make me one. I will make you one as soon as I can figure out how to do it properly. <laughs> It's a terrible, it's a terrible object. It, it's something that MC, MC Escher probably had a headache looking at. And he has headaches. He gives everybody else headaches anyway. Absolutely. You know, it, it's, it's a one surface um, space where the inside is the outside. This is very true. And that is a bit sort of screwy. Have you managed to find the picture yet? I might have found something even better. Like a three-dimensional version of the torus. Yeah, um, it is. Well, that's exactly what it is. So I want to see if I can do this. See, that's picture. Can I do that? Is it going to do that? Um, it might well do. Let's just bring it in there. Give it a name. I'm coming, people. I really am. Really, yes, yes, really. Yeah. It's so much easier to talk about a climb bottle when you've got one in front of you. Yeah, because everybody goes, what? It's very difficult to describe it. You have one of those. Yes, you can. It's very easy to see how it works when you see it. Absolutely. That is not what I wanted. This is what I wanted. So now we will go and look for and see if we can find it. I'm trying to get the, the, the graphic. Yes. It, um, does it? Uh, climb, climb bottles are interesting. To my mind, they kind of get filed into what happens when you go through the black hole. Oh, they are. Absolutely. Um, oh, dear. It's really not being happy with me on this. I shall use it. I shall do that. Yes, it's actually doing it. So That's hang good. on. Let me see if I can do share screen. And share screen. Now, where is the blasted thing? There it is. Here we go. Blow your tiny mind, people. Mm. It's inside, is it's outside, is it's inside, is it's outside, is it's inside. Ad infinitum. Ad infinitum, indeed. So I find it quite stunning. So there you are, Fiona. I want one just like that. Yeah, with or without the red travelling bit. I can manage without the red travelling bit. Good. <laughs> I will stop sharing. Yes. But, yeah, that's just, that has a single surface. If you do, I might be able to do this, but I haven't got any glue, so I'll see if I can do it. You can do it with a piece of paper, to a Merbia strip. Yes. Um, which I actually... My wedding ring is a Merbia strip. I, we got the person to make it um, as a Merbia strip and because of what it means, because pulling yeah. out what it means. Da, da, da. Okay, so you have your piece of paper like this, a strip, and <clears throat> fold it round so that the two ends meet like that. Now turn this one over. Yes. And stick it. Now the inside is the outside is the inside is the outside. Well, you can prove that to yourself once it's stuck down because you put a pen on one piece and keep going round until it stops and it doesn't. It just folds at the, at the beginning. And it's it's going round it. over yeah. and over the same line again. So just to repeat in case you want to play, strip of paper, curl it round into a circle like this, put the pieces on top of each other like that and then take the top one and turn it over and stick it with glue or stick it with a staple or whatever it is you've got. With paper clip. If you're stuck at home with small children during lockdown, this is a good toy for them. Yeah. And a learning tool. It is. And it is a serious learning tool because you learn an awful lot just by taking your pen around that. Mm. And it really is fascinating. And that shouldn't happen, should it? Well, except it does. Exactly. Apply to the bumblebee. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you you know, things shouldn't happen. Therefore, you know, if there's a universe, there's an outside the universe. 
Well, this is the other thing is that the universe is busy expanding. What's it expanding into? Yeah. And where did it when did it start expanding? And yes, we've got well, <laughs> even that now is all over the bloody shop because everybody yeah. thought they knew where they were with I cannot it's not Hubble, is it? I can't remember who did it. Uh, yeah, I think it was. It was Hubble, right. Yes, I think it was, yes. And um who said I've worked it all out and it's like this. And now we found things like the Higgs person, um, and like dark matter and dark energy, and they balls the whole thing up. Well, of course, the other thing that's come out in the last few years is that they actually went out and measured Hubble's constant, which is the, the, the which they the, couldn't when he started. Mm. But since we had the since we had the, the Hubble Space Telescope, of course, we could see so much further, mm. and they were able to measure the redshift of distant galaxies and discovered the Hubble's constant was well, actually accelerating. Hmm. It was no longer constant. <laughs> well, it, it, the number itself is constant, but it means the universe is accelerating. Yeah. In its expansion. So it, we thought, say we loosely, we mm. thought it was going to get up to a certain point and then it would come back in again. Mm. But it's not. It's, it's accelerating. It's going to keep going forever. Yeah. Well, we think it is. But I mean, Fred Hoyle was the one who thought yeah. it was going to come in and go out and come in and go out. And I still think he's got the right idea because then that makes your cycle and it's like breathing. Yes. But it seems that it's a damn sight bigger than he ever thought it was. It, it may simply be that it's there's something going on there that we don't understand. And it, after a bit, it will stop accelerating mm. and then start decelerating and come back in again. And they do think that dark energy may have to do with that because. Mm of this total this is another thing that can't happen but it does <laughs> um you've got um say I mean, this is how it was described to me by a scientist who was actually doing doing the work of exploring it up at um, Jodrell Bank they said you've got a box and you fill it with dark energy and then you take some out now if that was sort of air or water there would be less in the box when you took it out, there isn't the dark energy. It's still exactly the same. And yeah. you've got the bit in your hand. Which would seem to violate the principle of the conservation of energy, which is interesting. Yes. Yeah. So perhaps it's not a principle, but merely a guideline. Well, I think most of these things are actually guidelines. This is where you are now. Yes. Because exactly. when we were up there was this lovely woman who was messing around with dark energy um various people sort of said oh well, that's proved einstein wrong hasn't it you always get these people there are an awful lot of them mm. and this really makes me boil and so i sort of went, you know got my hand for a question and i said well you know without newton and his gravity theories and things like that there's so many things we wouldn't be able to do and without Einstein's theories, which built on Newton's theories, but apparently seem to say that Newton had got it wrong sometimes, in some places, at certain times, we wouldn't be able to do lots of other things. But we still actually need pastors light for various things. And so how about, you know, this is just another level. And she went, yeah, precisely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you've got to have this sort of like, it's almost like, you know, kids in the playground. Well, I'm right and you're wrong. Michelle explained it to me once as they're all true for a given level of truth. Exactly. Yeah. But for most people, if that's true, that can't be. And yet we live in an and and world, an and and universe. But of course, most people don't. We Not an either or. We have this trouble. Well, well, it's either black or white. No. I can think of various situations where you can mess that up. Yes. Um, but it no, it isn't. It's black in this situation, but it will be white in that situation. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the terrible fuss on the internet a few years ago with the dress that was either blue or green and nobody could make their mind up? Oh, I have that like trouble that. all the time, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it was blue and green. I think some people saw it as black and white and some people saw it as red and green or something like that. Something like that, yeah. And I, I never actually bothered looking at it. <laughs> well, I didn't I remember there was an awful fuss about it and people were arguing like fury. And it's, it's like, you know, 
children who haven't really got their act together at all they've got to be right otherwise you know and they've got to be better than johnny next door or whatever mm. and no you don't you can be you know johnny can have his opinion and you can have yours and yeah. you may both be wrong in certain situations and you may possibly both be right in other situations indeed right so <laughs> we're not just we're just not taught that we have to dog it was the other one we have terrible trouble with, with this. It's like get, getting people over this hump that it isn't either or. No, it is it and, and, and that. Yes. So actually, go back to the Big Bang again. The universe has a beginning and it doesn't. Yes. How about that? And in the same way, it will have an end and it won't. Hmm. On that note, I think we've blown our minds. I think we've probably got to the end of what we want to say for one day. I think we have. So we'll see you again. Yes. In a couple of weeks. Ta-ra. Have a nice mind-blowing time. <laughs>